The American Parasite No one thought it could happen in North America. A parasite that uses your body as its personal feeding ground, taking over first your stomach, then your entire GI tract, forcing you to crave the foods it wants, while slowly destroying your body from the inside out. Governments are finally admitting that this is real. Measures have been proposed in New York and the country of Mexico to try and stop it. But by the time you watch this, it may already be too late. My name is Craig Capetta. I'm the Director of Science and Nutrition at Whole Body Research International and have spent the last 24 months working with my team of doctors and scientists to figure out a way to stop this parasite that is already estimated to be infecting 250 million Americans. Perhaps the scariest thing is that its symptoms come on slowly. You may never even realize your fatigue, weight gain, or lack of sleep is the result of this bad bug until it finally takes over and forces you to seek medical attention. In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you a simple test you can do to find out whether or not you've been infected, and if so, how to get rid of it before it causes potentially irreversible damage. I'm also going to expose the major government screw-up that allowed this to happen and how they are now scrambling to fix it. Warning, the information I'm about to share with you is controversial because this parasite comes from the most unlikely place, your food supply. In the next few minutes, I'm going to expose the manipulative practices of several very large corporations, companies like General Mills, Nestle, and Coca-Cola, that they prayed the public would never discover. It's a tangled web of bribery that makes your average politician look like a saint and they are currently spending tens of millions of dollars in false advertising to try to cover up what they have done. But it's about time someone pulled back the curtain. That's why I've spent a considerable amount of time and my own money over the last few months creating this video that they do not want you to see. So if you're serious about the health of your family, turn off your cell phone, take a seat, and make sure you watch every word of this presentation. What you are about to see and hear may shock you, but it may also save your life. Let's get started. The year was 1950. The death rate by heart disease in America had jumped to an astonishing 30%. Only far back as the 1900s, it was 10%. In just 50 years, deadly heart attacks had increased by a factor of three times. People were dropping dead at an alarming rate, and no one could figure out why. Then, on September 24, 1955, America's own president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, suffered a heart attack, sending the entire nation into a panic. The crisis was now real. On Monday, September 26, the Dow Jones plunged 6.5%. The total paper loss of the day was $14 billion, the largest ever, including that of the Great Depression. President Eisenhower would not walk again until October 25th and would not return to the White House until November 11th, nearly six weeks later. By this time, the fear of heart attacks was on everyone's mind. Enter government researcher Ansel Keys. Mr. Keyes was a Harvard-educated scientist who had helped design rations for the U.S. Army during World War II. Mr. Keyes set out to discover why Americans had the highest rate of heart attacks out of any of the First World countries. In what would later become known as the Seven Country Study, Mr. Keyes discovered that Mediterranean nations had the lowest heart attack rates in the world. Their diet also contained the lowest amount of fat. He concluded the American high-fat diet was to blame for our heart attack problem. Correct or not, finally the public had an answer. In 1956, representatives of the American Heart Association appeared on television to inform the public that a diet which included fats such as butter and lard, and fatty foods such as eggs and beef would directly lead to deadly coronary heart disease. The government's own health officials began recommending people adopt a low-fat diet to protect themselves and their families. Brochures on how to eat low-fat were passed out in schools. No one wanted to suffer the same fate as the president, or worse, drop dead. Most were fine with Mr. Key's reasoning. He became a celebrated hero and was even put on the cover of Time magazine though he himself would many years later change his own opinion on the matter. For the time, a low-fat diet was universally accepted as the only surefire heart attack fix. Yet there was one sector that wasn't happy with this, and that was the big food conglomerates. You see, previous to Key's findings, their favorite way to flavor their foods was by adding more fat. Food scientists had discovered that fat was a flavor carrier. It could deliver taste and odor compounds from different parts of food and provided texture and mouthfeel that made food taste better. Without fat, food tasted like cardboard. 
but now the public was demanding their foods be low-fat. Processed and canned foods began to go uneaten as people turned to more natural, lower-fat alternatives. If it didn't say low-fat on the label, people stopped buying it. The conglomerates scrambled to find new recipes that would allow them to call their products low-fat, yet still taste good. Food scientists were called in by the dozens, and finally they discovered something even better. You see, unlike fat, this new flavor additive was actually addicting. It goes by many different names, but you may know it best as refined sugar. Did the food industry know it was dangerous? Even many doctors of the 1950s would argue they certainly did. As far back as 1808, studies had been done proving sugar was not only unhealthy, but actually toxic. Believe it or not, sugar manufacturers were pulling PR stunts back then, as they do today. In 1808, the Committee of West India, a large sugar conglomerate of the time, appeared before the British House of Commons to offer a prize of 25 guineas, about $1,000 in today's coin, to anyone who could show an experiment that proved sugar was good for feeding and fattening cows, hogs, and sheep. Food for animals has always been expensive. Sugar was extremely cheap, so many farmers took on the challenge, hoping for good results. The 25 guineas would be just a bonus to the new, cheaper food supply. But as you may have guessed, the attempts were a disaster. Many resulted in the death of livestock. One member of Parliament, John Kerwin, took on the challenge himself, trying to feed sugar and molasses to his calves. After the experiment of this well-known, highly-ranked politician failed, the Committee of West India gave up. Then, in 1816, the well-known French physiologist F. Majandi did an experiment of his own involving dogs. He determined that dogs fed with water containing sugar and olive oil wasted away and died faster than dogs fed with water alone. This showed sugar not only had no nutritional value, but actually caused negative effects. This shut the sugar manufacturers up, but just for the time being. Flashback to 1957. Fat was out. The food industry had found foods packaged with sugar were winning every taste test. But would the public buy it? As recently as the 1930s, Dr. Weston A. Price, a research dentist from Ohio, had traveled around the world observing different cultures and their diets. In 1939, he published a paper that revealed in horrifying detail what had happened to the teeth and health of those in cultures who had incorporated refined sugars into their food supply. Sugar still had a bad name. The conglomerates would need to make a move. Later, in 1957, noted Professor E. V. McCollum, who was often referred to as America's top nutritionist of the day, published a book called A History of Nutrition. In it, he argued that despite there being dozens of experiments done since the 1800s, proving sugar was bad for human consumption, those experiments were all flawed due to human error. This book was published and marketed with the same ferocity you see with bestsellers today. But where did it come from? No scientist has his own money to publish a book on such a grand scale. And let's face it, a history of nutrition? It's not a title that will make a book fly off the shelves. A look inside the book revealed it was published and marketed by a company called the Nutrition Foundation, Incorporated. Who was the Nutrition Foundation? I'm glad you asked. It happened to be a front organization for the leading sugar conglomerates of the time, including the American Sugar Refining Company, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Curtis Candy Company, General Foods, General Mills, Nestle, Pet Milk Company, and Sunshine Biscuits, about 45 companies in all. And did the Americans buy it? Oh boy, did they ever. Sales of processed foods skyrocketed. All they had to do was put low fat on the label, then dump in a bunch of refined sugar, and it would sell like crazy. A 2012 study by Dr. Robert Lustig of the University of California, San Francisco, revealed that sugar is just as addictive to the human brain as cocaine, setting off the same dopamine triggers and forcing us to crave more and more of it. So it was only natural that humans would begin to consume the new sugared products at a feverish rate. The food conglomerates responded to the increasing sales by using even more sugar. It began to find its way into foods you would never expect, like hot dogs, yogurt, spaghetti, and breads. As the decades passed, obstacles would spring up, but each time, the conglomerates had an answer. In 1965, the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act began, requiring their products to be honestly and informatively labeled. By this time, the public wasn't so hot on sugar anymore, but that made no difference. 
the conglomerates simply hid the sugar by putting it into new forms and creating new names. This way, people wouldn't see the word sugar on the food label, but it could still be hiding inside. Some names sugar goes by are agave nectar, brown rice syrup, high fructose corn syrup, dextrose, evaporated cane juice, glucose, lactose, malt syrup, molasses, sucrose. Another classic example is when the sugar pushers began putting the word natural into all of their advertising. Made from natural ingredients became their slogan. But all refined sugars are made from natural ingredients. So is cocaine and heroin. During the 1970s, armed with new studies showing the dangers of refined sugars and exposing them in all of their forms, the American public began to wake up. For the first time since the 50s, sales of certain high-sugar foods slowed down. But the conglomerates had prepared for this and had been hard at work developing yet another weapon of their own, artificial sweeteners. Perhaps the most notorious of these was aspartame, more commonly known as Equal or NutraSweet. The story of how it became approved by the FDA is startling. By this time, the diet craze was in full swing, and the diet food market was a billion-dollar industry. It was banned in 1973, and another artificial sweetener, Cyclamate, had recently been banned when it was found to cause tumors in tests done on animals. Aspartame was initially also rejected by the FDA, but its developer, G.D. Searle, was not having it. Searle presented the FDA 100 different studies that showed it was harmless, studies G.D. Searle had funded themselves. Why not? They knew if they could get it approved, they would make billions. But despite what their study said, every time an independent study was done, it was found to be dangerous for human consumption. For the first time in history, the FDA sought criminal investigation into a food manufacturer for misrepresenting the safety tests of a product. What the investigation revealed was shocking. Deceased lab animals from the tests were not autopsied for months or even years after their deaths, so that rotting would render any tumor data inaccurate. Other animals were found to have tumors cut out and thrown away. Then the animals with the removed tumors were labeled as normal. Obvious tumors were labeled as normal swelling. The FDA easily ruled that aspartame would not receive final approval. But what would follow was a set of dirty political tricks that must have made Abraham Lincoln roll over in his grave. G.D. Searle first arranged to actually hire the U.S. attorney who was leading the investigation. Samuel Skinner first resigned from the U.S. Attorney's Office, stalling the investigation, then went to work for Searle. Later that year, Donald Rumsfeld was hired on as CEO of Searle. Yes, the same Donald Rumsfeld that was Secretary of Defense during the Bush administration. He appointed several political buddies to top management positions and proclaimed he would get aspartame approved within one year. At the time, Reagan had just been elected, and Rumsfeld was part of Ronald Reagan's transition team, who was in charge of choosing a new FDA commissioner. They appointed a man named Arthur Hall Hayes, Jr. One of Arthur Hayes' first acts as FDA commissioner was to appoint a five-person panel to review the final decision to reject aspartame. Three of the five panel members still voted not to approve it, citing the animal tumors as a big concern. So what did Hayes do? Simple. He appointed a sixth member to tie the vote at three and three. Then, Hayes, a man who knew nothing of food additives, decided he as a commissioner should get a vote also. He then cast the deciding vote himself in favor of approval. Shortly after this scheme, Hayes resigned from his position as FDA commissioner, after which he was hired by Searle for a position paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I know this sounds like a tale from a political horror movie, but sadly, it is 100% true. After all was said and done, aspartame was approved. Coca-Cola began using it to make Diet Coke, which they then marketed as a weight loss drink. In that first year alone, the FDA received over 600 consumer complaints reporting headaches, dizziness, and other strange reactions to this new foreign substance our bodies were never designed to handle. But the food conglomerates had won. And since then, over the last 30 years, more and more of these refined sugars, artificial sweeteners, preservatives, and other unnatural elements have infiltrated our food supply, creating essentially a new diet without ever giving us a choice. The year now is 2013. Governments have finally wised up and are now backtracking trying to clean up this mess. In March of 2013, 
New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg fought to lower sugar and sweetener consumption in his city by banning regular and diet sodas over 16 ounces. This September, Paul Vanderwelpen, the head of Amsterdam's health service, spoke out to call sugar an addictive drug that should be tightly regulated. And just last month, the country of Mexico made motions to put large taxes on sodas, just like the American government did with cigarettes. But like cigarettes, these dangerous additives have now become what feels like a permanent part of our society. So what is the result of all this? What do these unnatural things actually do once we put them in bodies? Why did the dogs in F. Majandi's study die faster when sugar was added to their diets? Why are more people getting sick than ever before? Why are more people suffering from obesity than ever before? And why is cancer predicted to soar by 50% by the year 2020? The answer may frighten you, as it did me. Doctors are now saying it could be the widest spread health hazard to hit North America since cigarettes, polio, HIV, or hepatitis. In our lifetimes, this one thing will affect more Americans than all four of these combined. In 2005, molecular biologists at Rice University estimated it was already affecting 70% of the American population. What is it? It's the consequence of the unnatural elements we've been exposed to, and the deep, dark secret the food conglomerates are right now, as we speak, spending millions of dollars to try and sweep under the rug. They have some help from the killer itself, because this disease takes over your body from the inside. Most never even know it is there, until it's too late. Its name is Candida, otherwise known as the American Parasite. Candida is a type of fungi, a single-celled member of the yeast family. Where did it come from? Was it carried over on a boat from Africa? Or did it come from livestock? Actually, no. Candida is a natural resident of your digestive tract, along with 25 trillion other bacteria, some good and some bad. So long as the balance stays in order, which scientists say now is 80% good bacteria to 20% bad, your digestive and immune systems will continue to function normally. But here's where the problem starts. Candida is a member of the yeast family. And do you know what yeast likes to eat? You guessed it. Refined sugars, artificial sweeteners, and preservatives. All of the things that have been added to our food supply in just the last 50 or so years. Maybe you did the experiment back in science class, where you put yeast on a Petri dish and fed it sugar to get it to grow. That's what's happening in your stomach right now. Let's take a look at that picture again. These are actual candida albicanes growing in a petri dish. When you feed the candida, it starts to breed faster and faster and faster. Soon it has outnumbered the good bacteria in your stomach. Then it makes its way into your upper and lower intestine and throughout your entire GI tract. Before long, it begins to expand into other parts of your body, resulting in serious medical problems that can cripple your ability to enjoy a happy life. Fatigue, weight gain, sleeplessness, bloating and gas, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, skin problems, fungal infections. These are just the start of the havoc Candida can wreak onto your body. If you're suffering from any one of these symptoms, it's very likely this parasite is to blame. When you take antibiotics, Candida growth accelerates even faster, as antibiotics kill off many of the good bacteria that would otherwise keep it in check. It's because of all this, doctors estimate that currently, at the time this video was being produced in the fourth quarter of 2013, 80% of all Americans suffer from some degree of candida overgrowth. Dr. David Perlmutter, a personal advisor to Dr. Oz, who you may know from the show, and his current New York Times bestseller Grain Brain, recently stated, those of us who deal with this health condition in a clinical setting are witnessing what now seems almost epidemic. Dr. David Perlmutter. The reason candida is so dangerous is because it directly affects your digestive system, which is the largest internal organ in your body. It's also the home of your immune system. So when your digestive tract is weakened, so is your ability to combat sickness and disease. Left untreated, it can begin to affect every area of your life. Here is a list of common candida symptoms composed by Dr. Mark Hyman, recognized candida authority and best-selling author of The Blood Sugar Solution. General symptoms include chronic fatigue, loss of energy, general malaise, decreased libido, 
sensitivity to foods, chemicals, or other allergens, eczema, psoriasis, irritable bowel syndrome, toenail fungus. Gastrointestinal symptoms include thrush, bloating and gas, intestinal cramps, rectal itching, altered bowel functions such as diarrhea or constipation, yeast infections, frequent bladder infections, irritable bladder. Hormonal complaints include menstrual irregularities like pain or bleeding, premenstrual syndrome, thyroid dysfunction. Nervous system complaints include depression, irritability, inability to concentrate. Immune system complaints include allergies, chemical sensitivities, low immune function. And if your past history includes chronic yeast infections, chronic antibiotic use for infections or acne, oral birth control pill usage, or oral steroid hormone usage, your chances of having candida overgrowth are greatly increased. One of the scariest things about candida is the way it begins to reprogram you to crave more of the foods it wants. It hijacks taste buds, brain chemistry, and hormones to make you want foods that make it grow faster and mess you up even more. Breads, sugars, refined carbs, sodas, fried foods, carb-heavy foods like pizza and pasta, and of course, desserts and sweets. Do you often find yourself craving these things? If so, it's probably not because you're a naturally unhealthy eater, but because the bad bacteria has taken over. It's like they're down there in your stomach yelling, Feed me! forcing you to want foods that worsen your condition, make you gain weight, and make it literally painful for you to go on a diet that doesn't include them. Candida has also been linked to many studies, showing it could be the number one cause of obesity. As Drs. Carolyn Dean and William Crook write in their 2005 book, The Yeast Connection in Women's Health, most women don't have even an inkling that their symptoms could be caused by yeast overgrowth in their bodies. The number of women suffering in silence, not even knowing what is really wrong, and blaming themselves for failing, is, I believe, literally numbered in the millions. Millions of women who can't lose weight and have no idea why. The same holds true for men. Once the excess yeast is destroyed, many find they are able to lose the unwanted weight quickly and easily, even that stubborn belly fat most diet plans can't touch. So now, let's talk about how to fix it. Here's the good news. To start feeling better, you don't have to necessarily get rid of all of the candida. You just need to balance them out. As I mentioned before, your gut is also home to a lot of good bacteria. To start feeling your best, you just need to get to the 80-20 balance. 80% 80 good bacteria, 20% bad bacteria. There are two ways to do this. The first is going on a real, all-natural diet. That means completely eliminating all processed foods, refined sugars and carbs, artificial sweeteners, and also white breads. Then supplement your body with foods that are high in a special kind of good bacteria called probiotics. Probiotics are clusters of good bacteria that, like a powerful army, go into your stomach and form colonies that far outnumber the candida. They were first brought to attention in 2008 by Nobel Prize-winning physiologist Eli Mechnikov. Noting that Bulgarians at the time lived longer than anywhere else on Earth, he set to find out why, and deduced that it was because of their yogurt-heavy diet. He even named the first probiotic strand he discovered, Lactobacillus bulgaricus, as a tribute to them. Foods that are high in probiotics include sauerkraut, kefirs, olives, and fermented vegetables. Eliminate the unnatural elements from your diet and start eating those foods, and your gut will eventually balance itself out. But let's be realistic. In today's world, that is nearly impossible. Who wants to never eat out at another restaurant or never go over to a friend's place for dinner? Luckily, there is now a better way. Scientists have recently figured out how to load your gut with probiotics without having to change your diet at all. They've been able to put these living bacteria into pill form, so you can take them with your meals, no matter what those meals may be. They offset the bad foods you eat, populate your gut with good bacteria, and instinctively balance you to the right ratio. Once this happens, all sorts of exciting changes can happen in your body. You have more energy, feel more alert and more active. You can focus better on work. You feel smarter, more productive, more creative. Many no longer have the need for coffee or caffeine as your body is now able to get more energy from food and tap into it easily. Dr. Alan Walker, professor of nutrition and pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, recently stated, Evidence from clinical research demonstrates that adding good bacteria to the diet promotes a healthy digestive and immune system. This makes your disease-fighting ability stronger, so you get sick less often. In a 2001 study, 
children from daycare centers in Helsinki, Finland, were given milk with and without probiotics. Those who drank the probiotic-enhanced milk were 17% less likely to get a respiratory infection and 16% less likely to call in sick because of illness. Harvard Medical School has also recently gone on record to proclaim probiotics' effectiveness at preventing vaginal yeast infections as well as antibiotic-induced diarrhea. Dr. Michael F. Roizen, New York Times best-selling author and chief wellness officer at the Cleveland Clinic, recently said, Taking probiotics is a habit that can really benefit the digestive system, which is intricately connected to our overall health. Many also find weight begins to fall off, since your gut processes food more efficiently. If you've had trouble losing weight in the past, it could be because the candida have clogged up your digestive tract, which can greatly slow down your metabolism. You'll also notice those carb and sugar cravings fade away. You'll actually find yourself craving good, healthy foods that make you look and feel great. All in all, your digestive tract contains 60% of the cells in your body, so it's no surprise that clearing it up can make you feel like a whole new person. Oh, and before I go, I feel it's important I tell you about one more thing. It's important we talk about the costs of not taking care of your gut, because this is not a problem that fixes itself. If you are currently suffering from fatigue, irritable bowel syndrome, skin rashes, reduced sex drive, low energy, obesity, or lack of sleep, then chances are you are one of the 80% of Americans who has some form of candida overgrowth. Unless you are willing to make an immediate, drastic change to your diet, symptoms will only worsen for you as the bad bacteria continues to grow. Think of it this way. Imagine if all of a sudden you decided to never brush your teeth ever again. The plaque buildup that would form is not unlike what goes on in your gut when it's untreated. Sure, you'll be fine for a while, but eventually you'll begin to get cavities and mouth rot, and then you lose your teeth, and you are out of luck. It's very likely the exact same thing is going on in your gut right now. The food that causes bad bacteria to grow on your teeth is the same food that goes into your stomach right after. So it only makes sense that it would cause bacteria growth there also. But in your gut, the consequences are much more severe. While your mouth and teeth are certainly important, they are just a small part of your body. Your digestive tract is your core. It actually contains 10 times as many cells as the entire rest of your body. Untreated, it could begin to affect your health in ways I'd never wish upon anyone. Bad breath, constipation, acid reflux, indigestion, fatigue, lack of sleep, skin problems. These are just the early symptoms. The scariest part is that with 70% of your immune system in your digestive tract, if it can't function properly, you become susceptible to not just getting sick, but to some very nasty diseases like ulcerative colitis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, and arthritis. And those can't be cured by balancing your gut. That's why it's critical you get this handled now, before it's too late. Fortunately, there's an easy way to fight back against the bad bacteria. Simply take one capsule of probiotics daily, preferably with a meal. Within just a few days, you'll feel exciting changes in your body. You'll find yourself sleeping better and waking more rested. But with new, exciting energy, you are ready to take on the world. You are no longer tired after meals and no longer find yourself craving bad foods. But when you do cheat once in a while with pizza or ice cream, you still feel great knowing it's not going to go straight to your hips. Don't be surprised if your bathroom habits become more regular. Since you are no longer a slave to your gut, multiple trips to the toilet are a thing of the past. Weight may also begin to fall off, as your body is now a food-burning machine, no longer a fat and sugar storage hub. You'll probably also discover you no longer find yourself needing caffeine, carbs, or sugar. Many claim their sex drive goes up, as your body feels younger, sexier, and more vibrant. Your skin may even appear younger and firmer, as your body is better able to bring the nutrients from your food into your skin, replenishing your cells and giving you a healthy, youthful shine. And then, I can't tell you exactly when it will happen. It may be in a few days, or it could take a few weeks, but it certainly will happen. It's something I call the magic moment. The magic moment is when you wake up one day and realize that something is different. Your senses feel more powerful. You are more alert centered and on point. The air feels crisp and your body feels alive. Your serotonin levels have soared and your soul just feels like everything is right. Then you realize that's the way we humans were supposed to feel all along. And now that your body is running like a finely tuned machine, you know that you always will feel this incredible.
It's a feeling you can't really put a price on. Our health is our most precious asset. Without it, we can't fully enjoy anything else.